you know, sometimes you find yourself sitting next to somebody, maybe it's someone completely different to you. You can either just sit and look at your iPhone and not talk to them, or you can begin a conversation and see where it takes you. Peter, it is such an honor to have you here with us on Reflections. Okay. Yeah. You know, I started this program, um, I don't know, I think seven months ago, eight months ago. Okay. And I thought to myself, you know, we need a platform where we can bring incredible, um, I'm trying to avoid incredible, it reminds me of Donald Trump, uh, <laughs> really intelligent and um, spiritually enlightening people like yourself. Um, you know, in one place, gather everybody together and just to talk, because I mm. think that's really needed. It is. Thank you so much for gracing us. It's an honor, really. You've had such a remarkable trajectory, your work, um, your photography, and you're seen as a great ambassador, particularly by the Muslim community um, in the West. And I've had the great honor of having you shoot some of my pictures as well. Uh, and we've worked together for so many years. Yes. Um, so I, I just wanted to talk to you in the spirit of reflections. You know, the way we do things here is just we, we have a casual conversation about what you've been doing recently and a little bit about the work from the past yeah. and what you're doing now and what you hope to be doing, inshallah, in the future. Um. You know, I've been taking pictures. This is 50th year of taking pictures. So I've been kind of quite reflective about what I've been doing. Perfect for reflections. Yeah. So I've been looking back at all, all the periods in my life, the 60s, you know, photographing these people who are now iconic from that period and wanting to do something with it, but I haven't. But I, I came up again an idea um, this year, which was really... There are the icons and everyone knows about the Beatles and the Stones and all these people. You, you pictured Jimi Hendrix. I did, yeah. I did the last pictures of him before he died at, wow. uh, at the Isle of Wight. Um, but I, there were a lot of things that happened in the 60s which are very relevant to today, which is the peace movement, anti-war movement. There was ecology movement. There was a whole interest in whole food, you know, healthy living. Mm. It was interesting in looking at other religions and spirituality and all those things. Feminism, all these things starting in the 60s. And they came from a group of individuals who just became pioneers in that world. So that's, that's so I'm kind of combining the, the two things together. It's a project called Icons and the Beautiful People. Wow. It's a different way of looking at the 60s because it's sometimes d dismissed as a kind of hedonistic time of drugs and stuff. But there was a message of peace. People really wanted something. They were rejecting something and then it got lost and things. But these things come back. And I think now there's a kind of feeling now that there's a feeling about that in the young people. There's been some big changes in England with the politics of what's going on. And the youth voted, 70% of the youth voted in this last election, more than ever. And I was always sad that the youth were not kind of engaged in life in some way. But they really took hold and took responsibility. And I think that's a really good sign. We need, because it's all about them, they're going to inherit this world from us. So I'm really interested in what the youth are doing and we need to be able to find a language to talk to them. This project that you were talking about, is it yeah. launched? No, no, it's a, it's a, it was a proposal for a book. And Sounds that's amazing. Pretty, yeah, that's, that's, so that's that one thing. And then I have my ongoing project, Meetings with Mountains, which is about, which I was uh, talking to you earlier about, about photographing the saint, the true saints of the Islamic world. You know, no one ever knows about these people, yet we know about saints in Hinduism and Buddhism and all the other religions. But somehow, other than Rumi, people know about Rumi. But Islam is full of these people. But you don't find them easy. They're not celebrities. They're hidden away. And they choose to be. Hidden, they choose right? to be. They don't want to be. They don't want anything to distract them from what they do. Their life is just praying and studying and they live in seclusion. And that's and they're known by certain people that have had the fortunate good fortune to meet them, you know. So it's been my mission to find them and photograph them. And many of them have never been photographed before. 
they don't like to be photographed. As I said, not because they think it's forbidden. They don't want anything that exalts, exalts them. them. Yes. To do with the ego. Yes. Wow. And so for some reason, they agreed to let me do it. And many of them died very soon afterwards. And I got worried a little bit that maybe people wouldn't. But someone said, no, they knew that they were about to leave this world and that's why they They agreed. did it for you. Yeah. That's so And just beautiful. to see their faces. And then, so the book is really their pictures. And then what happened when I met them wow. during the session, yeah. Well, um, where can we get this book? I'm still, I've been working on it for 45 years. <laughs> I've just spent a, a year editing. I'm not a writer, I'm a photographer. So I found the writing bit really difficult. I wanted to find a language that was not academic, full of Arabic terms that no one could understand. I wanted to find a language that anybody could read. I sent it to a teacher in America who knew nothing about the Islamic world and she read it and she loved it. I said, wow. that's enough for me, that, that's great. <laughs> so now we have to raise the money to design it and finish the editing. And then I, I want to find a publisher. I don't want to self-publish. I want someone that's going to publish it and distribute it around the world. This is the true picture of Islam. This is a counter to all this extremist position, which is nothing to do with the true world of Islam. This is peace because these people are peace itself. Yes. They don't talk about peace. They, they, they are, they're it. living it. Yes. Just to sit in their company, you feel peaceful. All your concerns disappear. That's true Islam. You've been part of a lot of great projects. Yeah. Award winning, lots of accolades and awards. But one of your, one of the things that I really loved that you did was the Art of Integration. That was mm. an amazing project. Yeah. Amazing. Was, I've got yeah. it. It's beautifully printed. That's when as well. we first met. That's right. That's yeah. like from 11 years ago, right? Yeah. And we just relaunched, we just did a relaunch in Luton of all places. Yes. But it was really, it's, I feel it still has a lot of. What's wrong with Luton? CD? Yeah. What's wrong it's, with it? Nothing. <laughs> there. We place. met such great people. It has such a bad reputation. We met so many people doing amazing things. We met a guy who, who uh, who has, uh, has a thing called the curry kitchen. Every Friday, he's got three daughters. They prepare the food and they go out and feed the homeless every oh, week of Luton. beautiful. And there's so many people doing great projects with no money. And some, someone said, how come no one knows about it? It's the humility of the people. They're just doing it and no one knows. That this is, doing... These are the things people need to know about. Exactly. Yeah, so we, we did Art of Integration and we added seven new subjects into it. Oh, yeah. wonderful. Yeah, it was good. Oh, it's uh, available now, the purchase? Uh, it's, yeah, the ex I mean, I want, this ex that exhibition has been around the world. It's never been around England. Mm -hmm. This was the first time we took it out of London. So I want it to go up to all these places, Birmingham, Bradford, Manchester. It's such a beautiful because project. Because people need to ask themselves, what does it mean to be English and be a Muslim? How do you contribute to that society? Mm. We meant to be helping that society, not fight. Where do they get these ideas from? I don't know. That you have to destroy it. They're just people just living their lives. How can you think that you need to... It isn't anyway. It's not... It is sort of hard to understand, but this is, this is what's happening. If you were asked, you know, to give a, a definition of what a British Muslim would look like. <laughs> I know it's really difficult, yeah, yeah. but how would he or she, you know, look? <laughs> well, I think it's about, they would have certain values, which we relate to Britain. I kind of think it's old Britain, but that's not true. Someone said something about the British is that they have compassion. Yeah. and empathy. And that's true. The British, when things happen, they give a lot, yeah. even poor people. So that's a very strong... Islam, what Islam does when you bring those things together, it brings the best out of people. You know, that generally, even poor people, they're very well-mannered and very kind and generous. And I don't know, it's something about the British spirit. And they're very stoic, you know. Yes. They're courageous. Look at all these things. Crisis happens and people rush to help, not run away. So beautiful. This is, you know, there's so many good things that uh, the British are known for. It's sad that that's sort of being dismantled. Mm. But, uh, you know, I hope these things will be, remain in, 
You know, the English were famous for scrubbing their, you know, the poor people would scrub their, their houses would be spotlessly clean, even poor people, you know. What are you, um, what, are you what, what are the latest projects? I mean, what, what's the next thing in the pipeline? You know, I've traveled for 50 years, traveled around the world and I've collected all these pictures and I felt like I was, it was my job to document everything. And now there are all these young photog Muslim photographers coming, so I feel like I can lean back a little bit. But I need to do something with all this stuff, so I'm not looking at projects, book projects, exhibitions. What, what am I going to do with all this material I've taken? So I'm looking at that with various book projects. Because you've like amassed uh, over 500,000 Images, yeah, right? we, I mean, I have half, um, half a quarter a million. of a million of just slides and transparencies, now another quarter million of digital images. It's a huge collection and, you know, I need, it's like an uncut diamond. I need to do something with it. Um, so I'm waiting to see what, what is shown to me to do. <laughs> <laughs> We've had so many nice uh, trips together. Yeah, we, we, we were have. Together in, we were together in the States, I think. In Canada, uh, yeah, in Canada, definitely yeah. in Canada. Yeah, yeah, we met, we've kind of met all over the world. It's incredible. <laughs> and uh, I mean, the first time we met, I, 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 I clicked with you immediately. Yeah. I felt, um, you know, this is a... And I, that, that, the concert you did at Wembley, which was so amazing. Yes, the concert. 10,000 people. That was an amazing had, experience. It took a lot of nerve. I had to climb because I wanted to do this shot <laughs> because I wanted to include the audience in, with you somehow. And so I did this classic thing. I got behind. It was, I like yeah, it. Yeah, like, that was an iconic image. Yeah, actually. but it was just the fact you can look at everyone. Everyone's having such a great time. It's a beautiful. And you did the photo shoot for um, the Santa album. Yeah, well. I was so tired. That I know day. he was. So I didn't. Honestly, we were working on um, a track called Lament yeah. from the Santa album, and I'm not after a bit. I have to admit, we had. I didn't sleep. I didn't think. I know. I felt really bad, you know, eyes. because you, that you have, you know, the great legendary <laughs> Peter Saunders, and you, you know, <laughs> you don't sleep. It's just, yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't a very polite thing to do. It wasn't the right thing to do. But we were so into the moment. Yeah. Was, if not Arabi yeah, yeah. piece was so. I just forgot. I lost track of time. But the pictures were wonderful. Yeah, we they used were, the. They were okay, it was we, good. we used the um, the. Um, the, the cover, yeah. the front cover was... Um, yeah, I'm honoured to have done your photo. That was, yeah, that was great. Great honour for me. nice album too, beautiful. Thank you so I'm, much. I'm very fond of a lot of those tracks, actually. There was a book that changed my life. It's called The Game of Life. It's a very thin book. It was written by a, a lady called Florence Sh Chauveau, I think. Shin, no, it's Florence Shin. And she was a blue bud of America. I think she lived in the 1920s. She was obviously a saint, but the book starts, people uh, believe that life is a struggle. It's not a struggle, it's a game, but it's a game that has to be lived according to certain spiritual beliefs. That if you cheat people, you will be cheated. If you lie to people, you will be lied to. If you love, you will be loved. If you give, you will be given to. Oh. That's the beginning. It's so simple. So it's beautiful. an amazing book. It's very small and it's got so much wisdom in it. And I've given it to a lot of people and they've read it. It's kind of changed their lives. You know? oh. We need to get back to some simplicity. Life is very um, complex in some ways. Mm. We have come, become very complex. You, you, were, you said something really powerful um, moments ago. Um, we were talking um, outside of the, uh, the, the conversation, yeah. reflections. And you said that um, spiritual people of the past, their lives were much more simple. And we live in a time where there's just, there's just too much information. People are disconnected. I mean, they're not, pre you know, you s sit with people and they're not very present with you. Mm. You know, people sit with their phone, so they're having a conversation there doing something else. They need a hint or there. Yeah, so, so you're actually not really... So I do it. It's a terrible habit. Yeah. It's really, um, it's such an odd experience. And it means that that conversation can never really go anywhere that, other than a superficial level. And that's, that's what's missing in life. And you can still taste that in, in certain places like Morocco or certain places, people are present with you. Yes. Particularly in Africa, they're very present actually, because their life is much simpler. So what's happening around them, 
they're much more aware of. You know, I read this thing today, it said, God is life and life is God. You know, that we've made a disconnect, we've separated God from actually what's happening to us. Yes. And we need to reconnect. You know, things happen for us in life for a reason. We don't know. Maybe you might not know the reason why that happened until much later on. But everything happens for some reason. And there is some good in it. We don't know what it is. It may seem terrible at the time. And we have to trust that. You know, and uh, people have lost that trust in there's a purpose to life. We are actually spiritual beings living a human life, not human beings having occasional yes. spiritual moments, you know. And that, we really need to get back to that. And the youth really need to understand that, otherwise we'll lose them, you know. And they're much closer to the, to the truth, you know. And we need, they need to be listened to. People need to be listened to. That's what doesn't happen anymore. People have pains and you have to know why. People, you know, when you go back and find people where they had terrible lives, they were mistreated when they were young or abused and stuff. And then you wonder why they go and repeat the same thing out in the world. Because when a child is young, it's so looks up to everybody, it's aware of everything. It knows when people are lying to them. It knows when people are mystery, you know, because they come from a state of purity. Oh, so beautiful. Yeah. Is it true that, they, um, um, that it's said uh, when a person becomes a saint, um, they've effectively become a child again, because children mm. are God's saints? Yeah, they must go back to that kind of purity. And primordial yeah. purity. You know, uh, we, Hafsa and I we were taken to a house of a man in Jeddah. He was 106 years old. He was so beautiful. He had so much energy than all of us put together. He was running up and downstairs, getting us drinks and food and everything. He was amazing. And he said to me, I'm going to live till I'm 111. I said, really? And then some years later, I met a young man and somehow his name came up. He said, oh yeah, he died. I said, when was that? I worked it out, he was 111. And he was just, I mean, he was so youthful. It was just amazing. Very simple man. He was from Indonesia originally. Wow. Yeah. Where do you think this loss of the sacred mm. and respect for the sacred, where everything beautiful comes from, in my opinion, yeah. I think all people of faith would, would, yeah. would, would, would appreciate that. Where do you think that ultimately it comes from in the modern world. Because you, you know, we were talking about this earlier, children, young people, not children, but young, the younger generations um, don't seem to respect the older generations. Yeah. There's this kind of um, worldview and perspective that newer things are better. Yeah. The older things are to be done with, yes. just throw them away. Yes. And we're progressing, whereas People, some people would argue we're not, we're regressing, we're yeah, going backwards. Exactly, yeah. Um, I'm kind of answering my own question, but I'd love to know your perspective. Where do you think this loss of the sacred and particularly the inner dimension, the rejection? Because some people say there have been a lot of calamities in the world. Mm. There have been a lot of calamities yeah. to tradition and faith itself. But from the Islamic perspective, the greatest calamity of all was the rejection of the inner dimension of yeah, the Islamic faith. Exactly. The, yeah. Some people called the Sufism, spiritual the, the spiritual side, side or ad deen al-Ihsan. Yeah. Yes. Where do you, where do you, what's you your know, perspective? You know, if you look in at traditional societies, the elders or the wise people were always respected. That somehow has gone in the modern society, that when you're old, you don't serve a purpose anymore. Whereas they were always people that you went to if you had some problem or something, you could get some advice about what to do. But that's kind of gone now. So I don't know, where do people go? I guess they go to the internet or I don't know where people go for their, to find solutions to these things. So that kind of respect of the elders has, has kind of, and wise, I'm talking about wise people, yes. yeah, has kind of, has been lost in our society, which is... Do you think that's... Uh, there's a connection between that and extremism and the madness that we experience sometimes? I think so, yeah. I think so. Because 
We, we live in a world where people resolve differences by violence. That is not a way to resolve things. That means you don't respect human beings, you don't respect life, it means you don't respect God. Or whatever you call it, I'm using God, some people have other words for these yes. things. It's a term we use. But, you know, we have, it starts with respecting one another. Every human being has something special. God puts something special in everybody to teach us something. If we're not open to that, what think we're missing out on things all the time? Yes. You know, sometimes you find yourself sitting next to somebody. Maybe it's someone completely different to you. You can either just sit and look at your iPhone and not talk to them, or you can begin a conversation and see where it takes you. And you can agree to disagree. That's fine, as long as it's a peaceful outcome. Yes. Do you think a tradition can survive? without its inner core? No. Because we're spiritual beings, we have to re relate on a spiritual level. That's why religion has become problematic. Because for some religions, they say, I'm right, therefore if I say I'm right, it means you're wrong. Mm -hmm. People are just doing as a result of their life. Mm -hmm. So they're just mimicking what was done to them. Mm -hmm. They were. Unfortunately, I didn't have good, you know, I'm, I feel so blessed that I met all these people. I mean, it's a project, but I was the project. Going to sit with these saintly people, it was, for, you know, I hope I took some benefit from them. These people who spent their lives in prayer and study, I could never do that. I mean, it's really difficult to sit and pray for a long time, you get uncomfortable, your knees hurt. <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> but we try anyway, we do our best to try and find a calm center. Because it's not enough to say you believe in something bigger than yourself. Okay, then you have to trust it. It's no good saying, I, you know, I just trust God's going to supply everything. He's going to look after me. Well, then you're going to be tested. You're going to have times when you don't have anything. You're still going to trust then. Mm -hmm. That's when, when it comes to, to see whether it's real for you. So you can't say it unless you really live by that. These are very high aspirations, you know, and all we can do is aspire to it and hope that God makes it easy for us to do. <laughs> we live in a world where everybody's worried about money, you know. Everybody worries about everything. If people are scared to, like, get on a plane and go to, scared to get, fly in a plane, scared, at some point, you just have to trust. And then it's an adventure. <laughs> Otherwise, your life is a constant bundle of concerns. And that, You know, I've been that person. I, I thought about it so much, I thought, well, actually, I could start worrying about how can, will I be able to take breath. You choke yourself anxious about not being able to breathe. <laughs> I never thought about that before. <laughs> but it's true, if you really think about it. That's, that's one thing we have, we breathe. Yeah. It happens all the time. The more you become aware of it, the more centered you get. That's what they talk about in meditation. But that's, that's from God. The breath, every breath we have is from God, you know. Yes. We start life by taking breath in and we finish life by breathing out. Yes, yes. One of the great teachers I said, for the true believer, dying is like passing from third class carriage into the first class carriage. Mm. It's as easy as that. That's the greatest fear people fear these days is dying. Now, who's exempt from it? I don't know anyone who's been exempt from it. But that's if you think it's the end. It's not, it's a journey. Yes. Have you ever read The Lives of Man? It's a beautiful book. It was written like 300 years ago by Imam Haddad. Mm. And it's talking about, it's saying that we're on a journey from before this life, through this life, which is a journey from childhood to adulthood to maturity and old age, and then we leave and the journey continues. Yes. And that's the journey of the spirit. Yes. And it's an amazing, it's a tiny little book. It's full of so much wisdom, you know. The Lives of Man. Lives of Man, yeah. I really like what you were saying earlier, um, outside of this, um, yeah. outside of reflections, you, you, you mentioned um, how we need to redefine certain things, certain words need yeah. to be redefined. Yeah. 
Um, because to be mindful really is, from an Islamic perspective, really it's very much in line to Sufism. Yes. And the inner core of the faith. And it was really interesting. If you can elaborate on that, that was really, really interesting. Well, it's become very fashionable. And, you know, a lot of people are talking about mindfulness. And I was really thinking, yeah, I've met, I've met saintly people and they have, you know, incredible mindfulness, very incredible sensitivity. They listen to their heart. So when they're talking to you, they're actually listening with their heart. Mm. And then they get inspired. They may say things that you hadn't even spoken about. I mean, I've sat with people and I've had problems going on in my, in my life. And this person said, you know, you should just recite these things. Recite it so many times every day. And I've started reciting it and that issue, whatever it was, just disappeared. Now, how did he know? I didn't tell him about that, but he was inspired just by sitting with me. That's mindfulness. That's having a certain presence of mind to know what is right at that moment. Didn't have an agenda. He was just sitting with me. And that's, that's real mindfulness. And we need to learn that because it's an un, for most of us, it's an uneasy position to be. We're happy yes. when we know what we're doing, what confident, you know, this is our agenda, da, da, da. nothing else matters, no one else matters. But that's actually not a good place to be. Yes. We should be aware of everybody and what's going on around. Yes. Maybe there's someone there who needs help that you might not be aware of, you know. There is also that sense of tribalism as well. God forbid something happens, something bad happens yeah. in the UK or France. Um, you know, we condemn it. But then the immediate thing is, oh yeah, but what about Iraq? Yeah. What about, we condemn that too, you yeah. know, but we're one family, we're living together. It's yes. one planet, we're all interconnected. And we're not a private club. Muslims are not in a private club. If we're not tolerant of other people, we haven't, I don't think we've embraced true Islam. Yes. You know, if we think we're better than other, we're lost. God is with the oppressed. If you're oppressing people in whatever form, whether it's violently or whatever, or condemning them, you're, you're an oppressor. God is with those people you're oppressing. We need to remember that, you know, we've forgotten all this stuff. This is what the message that was, that was brought. It somehow seems to have got lost. It seemed like we got caught up in the detail. I had, I saw this vision once, it was a picture, and I, I still want to take this picture. I just saw it as one image in front of me. The scene was a desolate, it's after war, and there's a door, just a door of a house and a bit of the wall left. And there are two Muslims dressed very immaculately with their beautiful turbans, polishing the door knocker. I sometimes feel that's our, that's our position. We're so worried about the detail that we look at the, look at the world. It's really, I need to do that picture. It needs a team. <laughs> mm. I can see it in my mind now. Wow. We just got lost in the detail. Do you think that's the case for the Islamic tradition in general or Specifically, or do you think it's a general problem with all the traditions? Because we find that with modernity and yeah. the modern world, I know that Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad, I asked him this question, yeah. and he said, modernity is not one thing, yeah. it's many different things, it's yeah. sort of process. Um, but in general, the way I would view modernity is to see the world in a, you know, through um, the lens of quantity and not through quality. Mm. Um, materialism and, 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 and the materialistic um, kind of worldview, um, which is, I personally feel, inherently anti-tradition in general. Um, do you think that this could, you know, be the reason? Do you think that um, it's a modern problem? I think that, that People collect stuff as a way of filling a hole in themselves. I do it, you know, I have a room full of photographic books and stuff. 
But now there's a big movement. You know, I have friends who've got rid of everything they own. I, I think that's amazing. You know, that's a very powerful thing because they realize that having all this stuff just clutters your mind. That's very Islamic. I mean, the, the true Islamic position is to have that stuff and it doesn't matter. You're mm. co- completely detached from it. You know, you're in the world, but you're not attached to it. Mm. That's, you know, because a man can be trapped by having nothing as well as a man can be trapped by having a lot of stuff. So it's, it's, it's just kind of finding a way where you're detached from it enough. But from your, because you, you've obviously um, experienced uh, a, a lot and, and um, you had mentioned that you've been taking pictures for 50 years, yeah. you've been to Morocco, you've been yeah. around the world, you've yeah. seen India, China, yeah. everywhere. How do you see where we are now and the process of getting to where we are now? Um, do you think it's, it's got worse? It's worse than 40 years ago? The world? Yes. It's, it's, di- it's difficult. I mean, if you look at it as a human body, we always like try and shy away from illness. But actually illness is a purification of the body. So I try to now look at it slightly different. Of course it's not. I always tried to photograph spiritual Islam. That's what I was interested in. Yes. I was interested in spirituality because that's the thing that inspires me and, and enlivens me. So if I look at it from that point of view, it seems things are worse. But then if you look at it on a long term, maybe this has to come out. The body has to get sick if it's going to heal. Mm. All this sickness has to come out for there to be some save, saving of, the, of what's happened, saving the planet. We're in a position now with our planet, let alone hum, you know, human mankind. Everything is getting destroyed. I mean, I was watching a documentary about Antarctica the other day. There's this team been up in the Antarctica for 60 years. They built a whole thing there. There are huge crevices appearing, you know. It's just like, how can you say? Yeah, it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. Climate, doesn't, climate change doesn't exist. It's madness, yeah. really. Peter, you are such a remarkable person and you've had such an incredible life, you know, and I could I'm ask lucky. you... I could ask you about the 60s and the 70s and there's so much to talk about and all the amazing stuff that you're doing now. But unfortunately, we need to bring our program to an end. Could you share with us a final reflective thought on reflections? Well, I I immediately thought of when we, you know, you and I first met and then we went to to, uh, Egypt Yes. As kind of um, with the art of integration. And yes. all these journalists thought, you know, Muslims are being impressed in, oppressed in England. And we were saying, no, we have loads of freedom there. We can do whatever. We can pray whenever we want. We can, f- no one. I remember. Yeah. And they thought we were a government plot or something. They didn't believe us. <laughs> <laughs> but you and I have been very fortunate. We come from these two worlds. You know, and I always feel like I'm standing on the edge of, I'm looking at my Muslim brothers, and they seem to be like doing, some of them, not all of them, but some people have a really strange idea about life. And I look at England, and I got a lot of good things from England, you know, as I mentioned to you. There's a lot I really cherish about England. Yeah. And it's sad to see it, it's been disappearing. It's become like a corporate it's all about money and stuff. You know, every time it snows, people complain. Oh, we lost, we lost so much revenue. It's snow, you should be out there. You know, I had a Sudanese friend, he was never seen snow before. He was ecstatic. <laughs> we just think, oh, I can't go to work. You know, the machine stops. Instead of just enjoying it. We need to enjoy life. And it seems in the corporate world, there's no time for enjoying it. You're going to enjoy it later. What, when you're dead? No, oh, we have to have at least some time. In every traditional society, they have time where they stop. You know, when you step out of the... Yes. We have it. We pray five times a time. That's five times a day. We stop whatever we're doing and we prostrate into oblivion. Everyone, Everyone needs something, whether you meditate, you have periods of mindfulness. Everybody needs that to connect back to your heart because we get disconnected. We need to connect back to ourselves individually and then we can connect as human beings, as a race. But everyone's at such disconnect at the moment. 
I don't know. That's why I didn't first anything. That's beautiful. <laughs> enjoy your life and reconnect. <laughs> Drink tea and enjoy your tea. And hot water, because Peter Saunders, Peter Saunders likes hot water. But I also love tea. <laughs> we stop every afternoon if, when we're able. Stop whatever we're doing. Let the work stop and drink tea. Just have a bit of peaceful time, then we go back to work. Well, that's how you know it's quintessentially English. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, it was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.